everybody to our live AccuGraph training webinar. I'm Dr. Larson. I'm glad to have you here. Today we are uh, super excited because we have Kimberly and I've got my notes here about what she's doing because this is all her. She's put this whole thing together. I'm excited to learn from Kimberly today. She's going to teach some things that I haven't even seen yet, but today the, the point here is going beyond the basics getting beyond just knowing a little bit about graphs and picking the points that the computer recommends and treating. There's nothing wrong with doing the basics, that's great, but today we're gonna take a little, little bit further, step outside the box, get into some expert stuff. Now, I have to warn everybody up front, Kimberly's gonna break the rules today. <laughs> She's probably going to, to mention some things and teach some things that normally we say, don't do this. Part of the reason we say don't do this though is because we have you know so many folks that are beginning, so many folks that perhaps aren't as experienced or that um, are new to acupuncture maybe. And so having a good set of ground rules to keep everything safe and working right is a great idea. But sometimes you have to break the rules and no one knows that better than Kimberly Thompson. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Kim let her get started. Y'all ready for us? We are ready. Okay, can you hear me well? Yes, hear you just fine. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, and, hmm, I've been with Meridia Technology for about seven years now, maybe a little bit more, and been using AccuGraph ever since. And if any of you, many of you have been here longer than me. There are a lot of practitioners who have been using AccuGraph a whole lot longer than I have. And so you have watched my journey as I have um, gone through this process. It's been kind of exciting. And I'm going to share some things today. I'm gonna get my screen going here. I'm gonna share some things today that are then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you permission to think outside the box. I get a lot of practitioners um, who say, well, if I treat what it says in AccuGraph, will it help my patient? The answer is yes. Well, what if I want to treat from a TCM perspective? And my answer is yes, that's good too. Well, what if I am a massage therapist or a chiropractor and I have other treatment strategies? Will that um, change things on AccuGraph? And the answer is yes there as well. So I am going to share some things to help you to think outside of the box. And well, there we go. I didn't know I had created this nice little bullet items that jumped into my presentation. So today what you're not going to get out of this webinar is uh, the basics on how to use AccuGraph. We have done many webinars on that. Um, we have videos, we've written blogs, we've, we've taught you all your basics. This webinar is more for the advanced practitioner. And if you're not an advanced practitioner right now, that's completely okay because you will be an advanced practitioner. So we're helping you to look beyond um, where you might be now and, and move on to the next level. We're not gonna teach you how to find acupuncture points. We're not gonna teach you, we're not gonna focus on the basic point recommendations that are found in AccuGraph. And there's not a cookbook approach specifically. AccuGraph has lots of cookbook approach. If someone has um, nausea and vomiting, you can do a search in AccuGraph and you can find recommended points for that. And they are the basics that are in the TCM books and um, basic treatment strategies. But that, again, is not what today's webinar is about. Um, these are the things that you will get out of today's webinar. I'm going to give you permission to think outside of the box. I'm going to help you to recognize that the things that you have learned, um, your strategies for treatment that get you great results, those are really good uh, philosophies and we want you to use them and we want to use them within the realm of AccuGraph. Um, in today's webinar, you're going to get ideas on how to talk to your patients. So uh, we have multiple case studies that we're going to talk about and one of them 
I'm going to show a new patient and how um, we're going to go over his case study and you're going to get an idea of how I talk to my patients. Now, we have had webinars on that in the past to give you a basic template, if you will, um, basic strategies on talk to how to talk to patients. But in this webinar, um, you're just going to kind of hear my thought process all the way through at different stages of the patient. Then you're going to learn a few different creative treatment strategies. And I want you to recognize that just because they're my creative treatment strategies, they're not necessarily exactly what you need to do, but they might help you to um, come up with new ideas on your own, or it might ring a bell inside of you that for a patient that's hard to treat that might be helpful to you. And mostly I want to give you the confidence to be unique. We have all had many realms of training. We've all been trained at different schools. We've had different mentors, different people teach us things, and all of our strategies are good. And so I want you to recognize that the strategies that you have been taught or new ones that you learn, you can incorporate that into AccuGraph. So the next um, thing to recognize is how I got to this to this point where I think outside of the box. I obviously, um, I have a lot of experience using AccuGraph. With my seven years, I treat a ton of patients. I've done a ton of acupuncture conventions, met with each of you individually. You send me case studies and you ask for my advice and my thought and my input. So all of that comes into where I'm at today. Um, I have a TCM background, so I will always have a TCM twist in my thinking process. And for those of you that come from TCM versus five element versus uh, channel theory, there's there's so many different ways. So um, my TCM thought process has given me a greater I don't, want, I don't want to say greater. It's given me a different perspective in analyzing the graph. And for the first couple of years that I was here, that's all I did was analyze the graph from a TCM perspective because that's that was where my brain was at the time. Um, I went through a process where we talked a lot about root and branch along the way and recognizing that a root treatment is balancing the graph at a branch treatment is working with the symptoms that the patient has. And so having that philosophy over the years has definitely pushed me to where the, how I think right now. And then, of course, there was the AccuGraph recommended points. Once I started using those, my patients got great results. So I will never discount the AccuGraph recommended points. They are good. Um, sometimes I think beyond them at this point, but they are good. And then it's just been years of analyzing and exploring. Um, next, I'm gonna, I have a little disclaimer here. So as you are watching this webinar, you're, you're going to see into my very own AccuGraph uh, patient files. I've renamed them so you won't know who my patients are, um, but you'll recognize that I may or may not use recommended um, points that are recommended by AccuGraph. It does not mean that the points recommended by AccuGraph are not good. It means that sometimes I use different philosophies. Um, I want you to recognize that I keep really simple notes. You can, you can expand huge, and we've talked about that in other webinars on how you want to do your note keeping. Sometimes I just open up a blank. I have templates that I use um, for certain times, but sometimes I just open up a blank note and I type in the thoughts as if I had a blank piece of paper. So um, just a disclaimer there. And then um, I use whatever tools work. So people ask me all the time, are needles better? Are lasers better? Are stim plus better? Is it better to do ear points? Is it better to do body points? The answer is yes. And it depends on the day and it depends on the situation and it depends on the patient and it depends on what your resources are at the time. I've been on an airplane and all I had was a laser and somebody next to me was in pain. Laser was the best tool for that, um, 
for that patient. I've had patients who are afraid of needles and then other tools are the best tool for that patient. So you'll see as we go through these that I use a lot of different tools. Um, so having said that, are you ready to play? We are going to, I'm gonna open up my AccuGraph and I'm going to share with you some um, patients. Instead of using names, I've just renamed their chief complaint. We're gonna talk about a thyroid disease patient, patient um, a patient who was in a car accident with extreme neck and shoulder pain, hemorrhoid patient, um, and then we have a patient with walking pneumonia. I hope that as you are um, going through this, you'll recognize that this is exactly the types of patients that come through your clinic and we're gonna analyze the graphs. So give me a second here while I bring up my AccuGraph. So the first patient that we're going to talk about is a thyroid disease patient. And I have not, I'm hoping that as you have questions that you will, um, that you will post them, that you will post them over in the question window um, over to your left, I believe. And, um, and at the, especially with each case. So if you have questions as we are going through a case, if you will post them, then we can answer them. And if you have questions regarding my thought process or even ideas of your own on how you treat, I would like this um, webinar to be very interactive. So let's go into this thyroid patient. Um, she is a 37 year old female and I've been treating her for quite some time. She actually didn't even know she had thyroid disease at the time that she started coming in. And um, I'm not going to start her from the beginning. I'm gonna go to September 20th. Let's go to her patient file and we're going to go and it's September 20th and she has come in for treatment. I have graphed her and my next process after graphing her is to decide how we want to treat. So as I graph her, I'm recognizing a few things. Um, she's got some excess in the small intestine and the San Jiao. She's got excess in the spleen. Obviously, we see a deficiency in the lung, pericardium, and heart. And when I treated her that day, the first thing I'm looking at, I'm noticing the first graph that I look at is um, upper body versus lower body. So you can tell that she's got some pretty significant imbalances in the up, upper body, lung, pericardium, and heart. When I first look at this, my question to her is, wow, how's your anxiety level been? because I see lung, pericardium, and heart as a lot of emotional issues. So when I am looking at these, oftentimes that is my first question. And then I notice that the small intestine and the San Jiao are excess. That could mean a couple of things. If she was coming in and her chief complaint was um, musculoskeletal pain, it would make sense. And I could click on that graph and I could see excess in the small intestine channel that affects the shoulders, the neck, the jaw. I could also um, see the San Jiao channel, triple energizer, and how I could click on the channel pathway and then recognize muscularly what's going on there. The other thing that I'm recognizing when I just, as a quick look and analysis of the graph, is that the spleen channel is excess. So from a TCM point of view, I'm recognizing um, damp, um, heaviness, congestion, sluggishness possibly going on. So the fact that she is struggling with thyroid issues, that would make sense. And so I asked her if she had a lot of tendinomuscular um, issues or if it was more digestive in nature because um, her, oftentimes her chief complaints are related to digestive issues. And she said, well, that's funny that you asked. She says, I've recently, I've had a lot of shoulder and muscle tension, but I also um, feel like my digestion is really running slow. So you can see how the graph matched um, her symptoms. 
the first thing that I do when I'm trying to decide which points to treat, I click on yin yang. I so di disclaimer number one, I do not click on every single one of these graphs and go, oh, look, your pi score has changed from this to this. That's not necessarily the first thought process. I am looking at the baseline and asking a few questions. Um, now I'm deciding what to treat. Basic treatment obviously is written here across the top or across the bottom under each channel. But I jump to the yin yang. And as I look at um, the yin side, many of you have watched over the years. Um, there's a blog series that I wrote called I Am Convinced. And it's when I studied with Jake Fra Fratkin. Fra Fratkin, sorry. Um, I learned to focus on the yin channels as my main um, approach for a baseline treatment because in that theory of treatment, if you treat the yin channels, the yang channels will follow. So I always click on yin yang and see what's happening in the yin channels. For her, recognize we've got lung, spleen, heart, pericardium. Um, my first thought process for all of this was that the Ren channel was out of balance. Every one of these channels um, are very connected with Ren. The conception vessel, I think is what we call it in AccuGraph. So if I go back to my patient file um, for that day, what I did to balance her graph, September, 20th. What I did to balance her graph, I treated the REN. I treated lung seven and kidney six, and that was my baseline treatment to balance the graph. Then the next thing I did um, was I treated this the tendinomuscular channel because she said she had excess going on in the small intestine channel and the triple energizer channel muscularly, she had this shoulder tension. So I'm treating her face up. I can't necessarily, um, I can't necessarily go in and treat her back um, to deal with all of this musculo tendino um, garbage that she had going on in her shoulders. I decided to treat the small intestine and the sad jowl channel by treating the large intestine. So watch here with me for a second. Notice muscularly where the small intestine channel goes. You've got through the shoulder. Notice where the San Jiao channel goes. It goes through the shoulder and through the jaw. But I'm treating her face up. I decided to treat the large intestine channel. Um, I, tr I palpate for tenderness along the channel through here. Favorite points of mine are large intestine, um, eight, nine, 10, um, not necessarily large intestine 11, oftentimes large intestine 12, but these are areas where I palpate for tenderness. And then I want you to recognize, as I show you muscularly, where this channel goes. So this channel overlaps the same area that um, for treatment of the small intestine channel, it overlapped here. And for the San Zhao, it overlapped here. So by treating the large intestine channel um, muscularly, I am able to affect that same area. So that to me was the focus there. And we'll go back to that patient file again. And the other thing that I did for her on this day was I lasered down the chakra points. Um, recently, I wrote a blog and in that blog, we talked about how um, which points were related to the chakras. And to me, I felt like internally, she just had a whole lot going on with digestive, emotionally. I knew that the Wren, treating the Wren was going to help um, with the congestion that she was feeling in her throat and thyroid and her digestive issues. But just to balance her from an emotional standpoint, I added um, laser treatment to these points. And that was it. 
So I've done, a, I've spent plenty of time talking about it, but really I looked at the graph. I asked a couple of questions uh, regarding emotions, regarding muscular, regarding, I quickly came up with my treatment plan and, and typed it in. I balanced the Ren, I treated some points on the arm, and then I lasered the chakra points. I think, so the take home message here that I would like you to recognize is that sometimes treating an extraordinary channel will balance the graph. And um, as the more you study the extraordinary channels, the more it'll just kind of come to you intuitively based on the symptoms that the patient's having and all that's going on. And um, hey, the Kimberly, larger the value. Can I, can I chime in for one uh -huh. sec? Yes. You know, this is really a, a cool study because using, using the REN to balance the graph, we get asked a lot, people want to measure the REN and the DO. They want to the, they wanna graph them like they graph the main meridians. And um, they ask, well, how, how come, you know, it doesn't measure those things? And the answer is, well, we don't have representative points on them. Um, and the REN and the DO are the only, the only ones, the extraordinaries that even have their own points. And so graphing those is a bit problematic, but that doesn't mean that they don't enter into the treatment and that they're not important. And I love the way that you've actually incorporated that into the treatment here without actually measuring the REN and the DO, you can see exactly how they're involved. So uh, really cool stuff. Thank you. You're welcome. That was, I, my patients really feel deep, deeply connected when I do laser treatment and I treat the REN and DO. And when there's a lot of emotional issues in re involved with their chief complaint, adding the REN and the DO, if it fits into the treatment strategy, is really, really good. So um, having said that, I'm going to bring us back to AccuGraph and please repass the chakra points. Okay, I think what you're asking me to do is to put the picture back up. There is um, there is a, web, a blog post that I just recently did, and maybe somebody can add that into the comment section so that you guys can link to that and read about it later. But this is here's the picture that is in that blog post, and then you can read more about the thought process of that in my blog. So I'm going to move on now to a patient that we will call car accident. Let's see. There he is. All right, you like how I renamed my patient so that I can share them with you? So this guy here, let me give you a little bit of background. He, um, oh, and I'm not showing you my, not showing you my screen. All right, so patient overview. The guy was in a car accident and uh, he shouldn't have lived. It was really miraculous. He was in a coma for 30 days and- Is that, uh, is that really him right there, Kimberly, in that no. picture? Okay. Oh, that's not him. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So, but anyway, they say goodbye. His wife was in the car accident also. And I mean, it was just really traumatic for their family. And he has been through so much this last year, physical therapy and his doctors. And then he had a Western MD who told him, you know what, I think you should try acupuncture. And I say yay for the Western MD who did that because we have been able to do just the most phenomenal things for this guy. But I'm gonna go back to the very first day that he came in and what his graph look like. And I would like to talk to you as if you were my, if, if you were this guy and you were coming in and um, your wife is sitting there and you're trying to figure out whether or not acupuncture is a good fit for you. So your chief complaint is exhaustion. You can't lift your arms up over your head. Your neck is painful. Um, the doctors have done 
all that they can for you at this point and you just can't seem to get better and do you think that acupuncture might help and when they sit with me they've never they've never even known an acupuncturist before they've never see known anyone who's had acupuncture and and they don't even understand the medicine so i do a full intake on them and i sit down and i i take my full intake i take all my information they give me background um what's happened with his symptoms and i take you know i've got his emotions i i get i get some details down and then um he and I, I'm going to share something here. Let me come back to me. So I explain, I explain to my patient and his wife that acupuncture, I've got the naked Chinese man that one of these guys in my office and I show him the, the naked Chinese guy and I tell him that 4,000 years ago, acupuncture um, was developed by the Chinese and they figured out that these little tiny acupuncture points all over the body um, If you treated them They could help from symptoms within and I talked about their theory of how Energy needs to flow through the body and how energy has particular pathways I show them the large intestine channel and how it comes up over the face and I tell them, you know, it doesn't all along this channel, I can treat these points and I can help your finger and your arm and your elbow and your shoulder and your neck and your face. I said, but then the cool part is that the Chinese figured out that these acupuncture pathways also go internal. And that's why this particular pathway can also treat the large intestine and the digestive system from within. And then I explained to him that each of these acupuncture channels has an emotion that goes with it. I said, and so 4,000 years ago, the Chinese figured this out. And what you and I have done up to this point fits very much into the traditional Chinese medical theory. Then I explained to them that I have something a little bit different in my clinic that I use in order to um, help them to understand how I am thinking of their body. And I introduced them to AccuGraph. And then I tell them that um, at this point in time, we have been able to figure out how to measure these acupuncture points and show you on a computer screen where your imbalances are and how um, how acupuncture can help um, resolve their symptoms. So at that point, I open up I open up my acugraph and. I measure acupuncture channels and then we are looking at this screen and so I'm able to click on click on the channel and I show them this is a channel pathway through your body and you can tell based on excess well I do explain a little I explain about excesses and deficiencies and too much energy in a channel and too little energy in a channel and how that leads to symptoms in the body and I explain to them how when energy is flowing through the body the way it's supposed to then our body is able to heal itself I explain to them that my job as an acupuncturist is to be an engineer and to figure out where the imbalances are and we're going to use acugraph to help us to do that so now we have all of this information on the computer screen and I'm able to show the patient where the imbalances are and how they affect the body and that's when they sit there and you've all experienced this i'm sure where they sit there and go oh yeah that's exactly what i have going on and then when i'm able to show them muscularly how it affects them and then they jump in and say oh is that why i get headaches right there look look that's why i get headaches right there and and they're telling each other how cool this is and which i already know how cool it is but um i as I show them internally how it then affects the bladder and the kidneys and even the vision and the brain how each of these pathways are interconnected then they get really excited so I show them a few of these channels and as I'm looking through if there's something that jumps out to me that I can explain to them you know there are a lot of things but this channel right here is the one that um, really for this patient not this channel, but this graph was able to help them to understand how well I could help them. I showed them that if you started with the first channel, if 
we were going to start with the first channel and run through the body, the lung energy needs to move to the large intestine and the stomach. The spleen needs to move to the heart. And as we work all the way through, we work to the liver and then it comes back again. As you look at the flow of energy from channel to channel, it is obvious that because this channel is holding on, there's too much energy in this channel, thus the kidney channel is deficient. And so then I show him the kidney channel and I show how his spine isn't getting the energy that it needs. And I show internal pathways and how it affects um, his lungs. And as I show him each of these channel pathways, how too much energy in this channel then leads to problems in the next channel, then they just look at me and go, wow, so you're saying as you fix these, then all of these symptoms are going to change in the body? And that's exactly what um, what I was able to do with this patient. So if we go back to his, his very first visit and we went to that first graph, I explained to him that what he's been what's going on in his body is going to take some time and we're going to do a series of visits so we i treated him that day and did i we'll talk about my treatment here real quick okay so i treated the ren the do and i did tendinomuscular um ashi treatments in the small intestine large intestine and bladder and i did some massage you can see my notes are very simple so Let's figure out why I did that. When we look at the baseline graph, first we'll look at yin yang. So lung, spleen, heart, and kidney. I knew that he had a lot of emotional stuff going on. I knew that internally for the Ren channel, I needed to make a shift there before I could make a huge shift in um, the bladder and the gallbladder channel, which were more tendinal muscular. So first I treated the Ren, then I treated um the do so i did the ren and the do for him the bladder and the gallbladder channel and the spine and he had had a broken neck and a broken back and all that he had so those were the two things that i did for balancing the graph i treated the ren and the do and then i treated tendinal muscular um for his back pain so he was face down and i did um I palpated for pain along the bladder channel. Um, however, I needed to do that. I did the gallbladder channel, um, palpated for um, tender spots in the shoulders. And then because the small intestine channel and the bladder channel are so interconnected um, for musculoskeletal, I treated that as well. And I did some massage. And that's all I did that day. I did a few basic treatments, palpated for tenderness, and did some massage. The next time he came in, um, that's always the question. Do you, how much do you need to explain from time to time? The first time they come in, I do a lot of explaining because I want them to understand how I'm thinking as an acupuncturist and how I can help them. So the next time he came in, um, here was the change in the graph. So we'll do a comparison between the first and second visit. And... On this next time he came in, already they saw a major shift. They were excited. They were convinced. They were happy. They they had already had good results in treatment. They knew that acupuncture could help them. Was, were all of his problems solved? They were not. Um, what I did at that point, uh, here are a couple of take-home things I want you to recognize. He came for his first visit. I explained. I sealed the deal. I explained how well acupuncture could help him. I used Acugraph to do that. On his next visit, um, I use Acugraph to keep track of multi-treatment packs. So this patient, um, I they paid for a multi-treatment pack. They paid for six visits. I actually had to, this one's a little bit different. I missed a treatment. I had told them I wanted them to come in and I missed the treatment. And so I gave them a free treatment. I kept that in the notes. And so they paid for a multi-pack on July 5th. 
and they were going to get one bonus. So instead of six, they'll get seven. Today was visit one of seven. So I may, I kept track of that through a series and they knew that at the end of their series is when we were going to decide how well that they were doing. Um, what do I want to explain here? I did. So to balance the graph this time, I first thing I did was I looked at yin and yang and noticed the spleen, the kidney, and the liver are the three channels that are out of balance on the yin side. To balance the graph this time, I treated spleen six, and that was my focus. I knew that by treating spleen six, I was going to affect all three of these channels, and that was my focus for balancing the graph. And then I moved on and back to tendinomuscular, and I focused on the bladder and the gallbladder channel. Again, I did massage and I did treatment. And at the end of treatment, when he was all done, I added ear seeds for auriculotherapy. And that is how I moved on with that treatment. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna tell you? The other thing to recognize for this patient is I want you to recognize, so we'll take his first plus the next six visits. One, two, one, two, three, four. Five, six. We're gonna do seven because if you remember correctly in my notes, I had to do seven visits uh, for my six pack because I had messed up. So I want you to recognize as things are moving on, notice how nicely his graph is changing. And um, I always did tendinomuscular treatment on him. Um, the bladder channel, you can see how it is um, kind of stubborn. It started out excess, excess. Here, I mean, it was better. Here it's better, but it's still borderline excess. The bladder channel seems to be um, his place that he's holding on to. And then here are the small intestine channel. So at the end of seven visits, the thing to recognize here is we sat down and we had a talk and we said, we, I want to show you how nicely we've progressed. And I showed him the graph. I showed him how far he had come. And I told him, but we're not done. We need to do another series of visits. It's going to take some time. And the thing to recognize when the graph is really green like this, when you've got a patient who comes in and things are looking so good and if they're wondering if they're done, what I tell them at this point is your graph is changing, which means your body is changing and your body is accepting treatment better. This is all good news. We're still going to continue to treat. So to me, when the graph gets greener and they still have symptoms, all that means is that their body is ready to accept the treatment um, at a much better level than it was in the beginning. So there's less and less that I need to do to balance the graph, but they are still, um, they're still not done. So I hope that you can take that from that message. I am gonna just look and see if I have any questions. There are a couple of questions up there, uh, Kimberly. I was gonna, gonna point that out to you. Um, Mary Jill asked to, to repass the chakra points. Is that something you can put up and show again, Kimberly, or just uh, go over them again really quick? Sure, so the chakra points are right here, and I believe that you posted the blog post. So I did, yeah, you posted in that blog. The blog post. And so you can go there and read more about those. That's something that I've been doing um, newer and more recent, and that could be a whole webinar all on its own. So I'll just refer you back, Mary Jill, to, um, to the blog post. I think you'll get a lot. And after you read it, post, post a comment in the blog, and then we can continue that discussion over there. And then the other question, uh, Julia asked, what were the points to balance the REN? Uh, it was lung seven and what else in the first case? Kidney lung seven and kidney six. I'm gonna show you an AccuGraph. If you go to your reference section and you go to charts and you go to, let's see. If you go to confluent points, it'll show you the points that you use for um, the extraordinary 
vessels. So the Ren Mai is lung seven and kidney six. The Du Mai is, they're all listed here. So there's your combination of points for extraordinary channel, extraordinary vessels. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect. All right. We're going to move on to, how's my time? Kind of getting close here. I'm going to move on to hemorrhoids. I like that, hemorrhoids. I get made fun of around here because we're always talking about treatment of hemorrhoids, but this I just think it's so awesome that acupuncture can treat hemorrhoids and so many tough conditions. So this is a patient that I've been treating for a long time. Um, I want to go to February 2nd, is that it? All right, this is another one that I wrote a blog post about. I can't remember the blog post, um, but I'm sure we'll find it and get it up there. Um, this patient came in, She hadn't. I hadn't seen her in a really long time, and her only complaint was hemorrhoids. This graph did not look like a hemorrhoid graph. Typically, a hemorrhoid graph, if you had a lot of hemorrhoid symptoms, there would be a lot of excess in the lower body versus the upper body. But she had a lot going on in the upper body. And it just, the first time she came in, it didn't dawn on me. I mean, it, it did dawn on me that there was a dye my issue. That's the first thing that you want to recognize here. She's got excess in the upper body versus the lower body. You could look at the ratio here. This red X should be more centered. So when you're looking at that baseline graph, dye my should just um, jump out at you. So I knew I needed to treat the dimai. Typically, when I see all this excess in the upper body versus the lower body, I'm, th I'm thinking a lot of emotion. So I asked her, have you had a lot of um, a lot of emotional stuff going on? And she said, no, I've had some sciatic pain. And so I said, okay. So we treated um, Let's see, go back to February 2nd. So for that, I treated the diamine. I treated spleen eight. I did a lot of upper body shoulder tension type of stuff. And then I treated, so as I'm looking at this, my thought process, first thing I did was treat the diamine. That would balance the graph. And the spleen channel was excess, so I treated spleen eight. Recognize that, um, let's see, spleen eight is one of my favorites for um, treating that excess in the spleen channel. So the dimai treated the upper body versus the lower body. Spleen eight treated the um, excess in the spleen channel. Spleen five is the sedation point, but Spleen eight is the she cleft point right here. She cleft is another point that is really great for um, treating excess in the channel. And so that was my focus there. And then I did traditional hemorrhoid treatments. I did GV20 at the top of the head and I did bladder 58 down on the leg. And then because she had some low back pain, I thought, well, may, if we work with the low back pain, then that will help with the hemorrhoid. So this patient came back the next week and she said to me, let's see, she came in on February 2nd. So then she came back a couple of days later, her next visit, you know, she paid for a three pack of visits. And again, her, her graph didn't really change. And I was concerned that I hadn't made a change. It, it was a stubborn graph. And so what you're going to get out of this case study is how you're, how to deal with this stubborn graph. So she had some muscle spasm on her inner leg, um, which I attributed to the spleen channel. If you click on the spleen channel and open that up, I'll come back to that in a second and we can look at it. She had some right-sided sciatica, about the same. Hemorrhoid was less swelling, less pain. Um, so her hemorrhoid was doing a little, a little bit better, 
But so I started digging deeper and I said, tell me what's been going on. This graph just doesn't look normal. She goes, oh, I forgot to tell you. I had breast augmentation surgery in September of 2014. And um, so now let's go back at the graph. Now the look at the graph now that we have that type of information. So you go to our older graph last week. All of this upper body stuff going on and a deficiency in the lower body and it wasn't extreme emotions and she had had low back pain and when I wrote that blog I created this graphic let me just show you here where'd it go there it is so if you recognize um, the channels that go through the breast the stomach the kidney the spleen and the liver if you've got scar tissue in this area, it's going to cause a problem um, in relation to energy moving between the upper body and the lower body. So as this patient and I progressed, I now knew that in order to, in order to get rid of her sciatic pain, I needed to be a little more aggressive. So over time as I was treating her, I began doing laser treatment um, for the scar tissue underneath the breast and as we did that that was one thing that i did so that i could um, help those channels to move she had scar tissue under the breast and i could just feel it with palpation so i didn't want to use needles that was under her breasts obviously she wouldn't be very happy if i uh, poked her new breasts with a needle so we used laser and we were able to open up the um upper body lower body imbalances and you can see how the graph began to change and with that her low back pain changed and her hemorrhoids changed and then the other thing my other trick with this when you have um a spleen channel that is just an upper body dime when you have a dime issue and the spleen channel is just really really stuck i will palpate notice the spleen the liver and the kidney she had deficiencies in the liver and the kidney and she had excess in the spleen so when i'm treating the dimai um which is sanjiao 5 and gallbladder 41 i am also doing a lot of needling all the way up the inner leg specifically on the spleen channel possibly on the liver and kidney i palpate for excess because every one of those um, channels that come down the body, we'll go back, all of these channels in the upper body, lung, pericardium, heart, every one of these have to somehow connect internally and then come down the body so that all of these lower body channels can then go back up again. So the liver channel has to go up the kidney channel has to go up. Um, the gallbladder channel, well, that one's coming down. The stomach channel, the spleen then has to go up. So as you're looking at all of these channels that have to go up the inside of the leg, sometimes you just have to palpate and you have to needle. So while you're treating the dimai, if you will um, palpate and needle those extra points, um, you will get much better results, especially for a stubborn graph. Let's see. I think those were the main points I wanted to make regarding this stubborn graph and let AccuGraph be um, a tool to help you ask questions that maybe the patient hasn't given you the full information. And um, yeah, I think that that is what I wanted to say. And Mary Jill had a question. Mary Jill says, is the dimai the same as a belt block? And the answer to that is yes. I have written multiple blogs um, over the years. Sometimes you'll have a dimai or a belt block where there's excess in the upper body versus the lower body. And the upper body channels, when it's in the upper body channels, it tends to have an emotional component to it. And so um, I treat the dimai and then I focus on emotions. Um, CV17, the lung, the pericardium, and the heart all cross at CV17. So I will treat there. If it's excess in the lower body and you have 
a spleen channel that's very, very stubborn. I'll treat the dimi, but then I will do a lot of work palpating up the inner leg. Um, oftentimes, I'll treat spleen six through nine. Um, sometimes some liver points, sometimes some kidney points. And the purpose of that is just to create a nice push back up the inside of the legs so that the dimi, the energy will push upward. And then it looks like there was another question, which laser um, for the breast scar tissue? If the scar tissue is new and there's still inflammation and I know about it ahead of time, I'm using the blue laser because the blue laser will help resolve inflammation. Um, sometimes, recently I've been using the all lights and um, because I'm dealing with the muscle tissue and the scar tissue and the acupuncture points. And so um, red and red will be for older issues, um, areas that need to be tonified. Blue will be for newer issues where there's inflammation involved. And I've used both the red and blue lasers and I've used both the red and blue all lights. The all lights are kind of nice because you can um, oil the area and then um, really just it's sort of like you're massaging the muscle and you're finding the areas of stagnation and you're working through the stagnation and as you do that um, the blockages are released more questions all righty okay i'm going to do i have one more case study and we're gonna jump into that real quick looks like maybe you have a question adrian no, no, I was just following along. I was about to say, I think we can squeeze in your walking pneumonia case. So go for it. Okay. Walking pneumonia. Walking pneumonia. All right. This I thought was an interesting graph. And by the way, I didn't like save these graphs up for years and years just so I could do a great case study analysis. These are graphs that I have done just a lot of them just in the last little while. This walking pneumonia case, um, patient came in two times. I mean, I've only seen him a few times lately. And when he came in the first time, his wife sent him in. He had had some blood in his urine and um, he was complaining of seasonal allergies and he just felt really off. And so I did a full intake and let's see, which date do I want to look at? The 22nd. So the week before when I had seen him, the liver and the kidney were excess, spleen was deficient, gallbladder was deficient, fairly healthy guy and um except for lately and i treated what did i do just by looking at this i would have tonified the spleen i would have treated the spleen the kidney and the liver so i could treat spleen six to balance the graph for this guy because all three of those channels cross at spleen six. And so oftentimes um, that's my simple method of balancing the graph and then dealing with symptoms. He had excess in the kidney and the liver. I knew he had a yin deficiency heat going on. So I treated the source point also for kidney and liver. And then he came back a week later. I told him, you know, let's go through a series of three visits and see how things are. So then he came back a week later and he comes in and he goes, I'm a mess. I have walking pneumonia. I just left the doctor's office and I don't know what to do. And I said, okay, let's, let's graph you. So I graphed him and I was expecting to see major big issues in the lung. I mean, if you have walking pneumonia, you would think that the lung would have huge issues. And um, it didn't. And he didn't even have... Uh, Oftentimes, I'll teach you guys by elements if the lung and the large intestine are out of balance, that you have issues for low immune system. He didn't have that. Um, what he did have was liver and kidney excess. And I'm going to click on the liver and kidney channel. So here's the liver channel. 
if you look at the internal pathway of the liver channel, you can see how as this um, heat rises up the liver channel, it affects the liver, the gallbladder, the lung, the throat, the eyes, the head. So there was a component of the lung through the liver channel. And then if you click on the kidney channel, the kidney channel where he had had excess affects the lung and and the throat. So I just thought it was interesting to recognize that sometimes it's the internal pathways that bring you back um, that bring you back to understanding what's going on with the patient. So I've had people say, well, you know, that acugraph, it, that this patient has lung cancer and nothing is showing up in their lung at all. Well, sometimes you have to look at the internal pathways. So that is a point that I wanted to bring across on this. And then a few other ways that I used acugraph. I, um, that day on September 22nd, I quickly printed him out a dietary recommendation for lung phlegm heat, liver yin deficiency heat and kidney yin deficiency heat. And we've taught you how to do that in other webinars, but um, regardless of what I saw in the graph to balance the graph, I knew that he needed some dietary recommendations for home. So that was one of the things that I did. I sent him home with um, food that he should eat. I also um, sent him I emailed him a recipe. One of our on our TCM Foodie webinars, we talked about a series of emails that you could have for patients, and I sent his wife right away. Um, I sent her. What did I send her? Oh, the recipe for steamed pears um, that's in the TCM Foodie email series. So if you're interested in finding those, you'll have to go back to that webinar and see the handouts or the options for buying those resources. But I had something in my computer right away and I quickly sent those recipes. I balanced the graph and then I, where am I? So I balanced the graph by treating um, liver three, kidney three. I think I did spleen six as well. I treated the REN and then I, I treated CV12, CV17 and lung one. So if you go back um, to look at his, his last graph, CV12, um, REN12. Whoops. REN12. Why did I treat REN12? Ren um, sorry, guys. Give me a second here. So I had treated, I had opened the REN by treating lung seven and kidney six. REN12 was to support the spleen in transforming the phlegm. CV17 was to open up his chest and to calm his emotions. And then lung one was, is the front moo of the lung. And so I knew that we needed to really focus on his lung. I used white flower oil on his chest. And then I used the vibrocussor on his upper back. Um, the vibrocussor is a tool that I use for... Um, it it uses compression it use vib uses vibration and percussion at the same time and i wanted to strengthen help his lungs to resolve some of that phlegm so i use the vibrocussor so you can see acugraph was still my resource it even though it didn't show a problem in the lung i used it for dietary recommendations i used it to understand how excess in the liver and kidney were affecting his lungs and then, of course, I used it for notes. So you can see how there are many, many ways of using Accugraph in that process. I'm going to check for questions here real quick. And I don't see any new questions there, Kimberly. Okay, good. I'm going to, not good. I mean, if you have <laughs> questions, please post them. But um, 
I'm going to get back to my slide presentation here. And so there are some things that I want you to remember that we talked about um, that we talked about as we went through these case studies. First, if you know your basics first, they will always work for you. You can balance the graph by treating the tonification and sedation point. That is absolutely a valuable way. You can balance the graph by treating the ear. You can balance the graph by treating the back shoe. But you can also think outside of the box and um, use the knowledge that you have in other ways. Number two, just balancing the graph is not enough. I just that's I just want to say there are so many people who will call me and um, there are people who will call me and they will say, oh, AccuGraph, that you mean it's going to give me all the answers and if I just treat the points, the patient's going to get better? No. Can I just say that really loud? No, no, no. AccuGraph is a source. And if you treat the points that AccuGraph says that are imbalanced, 80% of a patient's symptoms fall off the plate just because you're putting their body in balance with AccuGraph. But it's not going to fix the, ten the tendinal muscular problems. It's not going to fix spinal misalignments. The other resources and the other tools that you have that you add to AccuGraph, that's where you become an expert. If you want to be an expert, use all the tools that you have. Don't forget to use AccuGraph. That's really important. But um, all the other tools that you have are really, really important as well. So let's move on. OK, the other thing, you can balance the small intestine tendinomuscular channel through the large intestine channel. And you saw me talk about that earlier. Um, the small intestine tendinomuscular channel comes right through this area. So does the large intestine tendinomuscular. So if you have to treat the person's neck, back, and shoulders um, that the small intestine channel addresses, if they're face up, treat right here along the large intestinal and muscular channel, and it will relax that whole area in the back, and you'll get great results. The next thing, extraordinary channels often balance the graph. Explore yourself. Do, um, do some exploration. There are lots of things that you can do to balance the graph. You can also sometimes, uh, will the chakras work to balance the graph? Can you balance the graph by the front move points? Can you balance the graph with the ears, tendinal muscular? There are lots of different ways and you should explore them. Um, stubborn graphs take creativity. Sometimes you have to pick it apart. Sometimes you have to do a whole lot of work on the inner leg. Um, some, you have to get creative and be persistent, but they do change with persistence. Green doesn't mean done. If you have a patient and their graph is all green and they still have symptoms, I just hope that you'll remember to say, look at you. Your body is responding so well to acupuncture. Now it's going to respond even better when I work on um, your chief complaint today. Let's get started on treatment. That's really all you have to say. Get, get moving on treatment and move on and congratulate them that their body loves acupuncture so much. And then recognize that there are many, many tools to treat. I do use needles. I love to use needles. I am a TCM practitioner and I was taught to use needles, but I use Stimplus. I use the Vibra Professor. I love to use lasers. Uh, there are so many tools and all of these tools also help balance the graph. And I hope that you um, will become an expert in AccuGraph analysis and AccuGraph treatment because your experience is valuable and I hope that you'll share your experience over on the blog, um, not on the blog, on, well, sure, answer comments on the blog, but over in our Facebook user group, we want to hear your experience because we can grow from it. Now I'm going to get accused of talking really, really fast because I reached the end, but if you have questions, you can email me and I hope that you will. Are you, are there slides okay. that you're going through right now, Kimberly, or are you just talking off the cuff? Uh, no, there were slides. Ha. I'll go back and, and slide through them real quick. 
Let's see. Things to remember. Know your basics. Use your tools. Use the small test. Now you're you're still seeing me? Yep. Hmm. Give me a second. There we go. Okay. Now we're seeing your slides. There you go. Use your basics, use your tools, become an expert. Don't forget about that large intestine tendinal muscular channel. That is a lifesaver right there. And um, extraordinary channels. And when I do the extraordinary channels, I often add other things. I think that was the point. If I do the extraordinary channels, I add the chakras or the front moo or auriculotherapy or tendinal muscular treatment. But you can often use extraordinary as your baseline treatment. Um, get creative with those stubborn graphs. Don't, don't get tripped up when the graph is green and your patient says, wait, am I better? Because they're not. It just means they're doing well. And um, explore with tools. Tools are great. I love them. And obviously, you guys know I love them. I like to write about them when something comes across my plate. And we love your experience. Now you can send me emails. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, well, hey, I just want to say excellent presentation, Kimberly. Uh, really cool clinical nuts and bolts stuff. And it is outside the box. This is the kind of thing that we don't teach in the basic seminars and webinars that we do. So uh, thanks for giving us all that perspective. I've seen a lot of nice comments, um, a lot of great uh, feedback for you, and a lot of appreciation. Anything else to add before we close today? I don't think so. This has been a fun webinar to create. It's, it's fun to break the rules, right? <laughs> and I love that you used your own patience. This is, you know, this isn't the, the theoretical, we're going to teach you the theory. This is the practitioner stuff. This is how I fix this person. This is how I help them get better. And I think that that's exactly what we need more of. So thanks again, Kimberly. Really cool. Thank you all for participating. Um, and Kimberly had her email address up there. Feel free to reach out to her with questions. And we will see you all at next month's webinar. Bye, everybody. <laughs>